frame houses, you have to, and the insulators know this, they know how to do it from the outside. You have to put in like these socks, these net socks into each joist bay. Otherwise you start blowing and it's going and going and going. <laughs> and what you're doing is you're filling the floor joist cavity. Welcome to the Fine Home Building Podcast, our weekly discussion of building, remodeling, and design topics aimed at anybody who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses. I'm Senior Editor Patrick McComb. Today I'm joined by Mike Girton, Fine Home Building Editorial Advisor. Hello. Andrew Zellner, Fine Home Building Editorial Director. Morning, Patrick. And Jeff Rose, Senior Editor. Hello. You can find previous podcasts and check out the show notes at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. Please email your questions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. It is great to see you guys. Thanks so much for being here. Good to be here. Always a pleasure. Mike, you're back in Rhode Island, right? I am. I've been here for uh, two and a half weeks. Has it been winter uh, in your estimation to <sighs> the degree that you're not enjoying it? <laughs> <laughs> you, you know... In southern New England, March is like this. It's my least favorite month um, in some ways. It, it's, you know, you're, you're anticipating spring, hoping for spring, and it, February's over, and it just rains, and it's in that in between like 30s and 40s and mud. <laughs> but there are crocuses and daffodils, and, uh, you know, it's, it's getting better. I love the longer days, right? That's hugely better. Yeah, that's, that is one benefit. More than 12-hour daylight a year, a day is great. You, I'm guessing, came back to town to uh, present at the JLC live show. Is that part of why you came back to Rhode Island? Uh, in part, yes. And in part, it was uh, my mother had a problem with her house. So <laughs> her, she, she has a, a, a clogged up pipe from the house to the septic tank. It's 300, 300 feet away, and it's like got zero slope put in in the 1960s. It's Orangeburg pipe for a good part of it. Oh, and, wait a uh, minute. You'll have to tell folks what that is because that's a horrible thing. <laughs> oh, it is. <laughs> Our, Orangeburg was like uh, post cast iron and pre PVC. It was this period of time in the, I think, just the 50s and 60s where it's like a asphalt impregnated cellulose of some sort. And they formed it into pipe, and it's brittle, and you can't patch it. And it, it, it on, in ground, what happens is uh, any stones that you put in around the pipe when you backfill, over time, even though it's you know maybe three feet down, the 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 stones would uh, impinge on the side and actually start to deform or crush the pipe in those freeze thaw cycles. Fortunately, I didn't have to dig up the line. I just had to uh, I snaked it partly. I only have a 75 foot snake, so that didn't do everything. So I, I got a uh, a uh, bladder. It's a uh, uh, it's it looks like a black sausage, and mm -hmm. it's got a hose fitting at one end, and you connect it. And when you turn the water on, it expands the. It's like balloon like rubber. It'll expand it so it fills the uh, space of the pipe, so water can't come back at you. And then the other end, at the uh, discharge end, it has a small hole, so the water flows in. So you kind of like pressurize the pipe downstream and push out the clog. So a couple hours of that work, and oh, it's the most disgusting <laughs> job I've done in a long time. <laughs> oh. oh, man, that's awful. Um, so I'm guessing, you know, that there is a longer term solution for this pipe. Am I right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I've been delaying that for until uh, something else occurs. So, yeah, I warned my mother if I did have to dig the pipe up, I have to get my machine in there, which means there goes her flower garden and part of her vegetable garden. Um, for, oh, yeah, it's going to be yeah. a huge mess. You know, have you, you thought about over. this uh, pipe bursting technology or relining technology? Have you explored those? I've read about them. I've seen the videos. I'm just worried that Orangeburg pipe isn't a good candidate, but I'm not <laughs> entirely sure. Yeah. Wow. Well, keep us posted on that because that is a sad tale. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, what have you been doing? Uh, so I, I was, uh, on the East coast last week. I got to see you Patrick in person. Uh, I got to, uh, hang out with Mike a little bit at the JLC live show. Um, but very much like Mike, like March is the, the month in Minnesota where 
you know, the weather toys with you a little bit. You're like, oh, it's like light outside after work and, you know, the snow's starting to melt. And then all of a sudden, you know, you got 40 degrees one day and the next day it's eight degrees. And then <laughs> last night we had a thunderstorm. Um, and like now that's turned into a winter weather advisory. <laughs> um, and, you know, as, as Prince, as Prince said, sometimes it snows in April, you know, and, uh, <laughs> What did you think of the uh, JLC live show this year? This is your second year, and uh, we're going to talk about the JLC live show and the after show a little bit, and I hope to get into uh, the kind of behind-the-scenes conversation of how it gets put together. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing Mike's going to have some <laughs> tales to tell. And uh, uh, what what did you think about it, Andrew? Uh, it it was a great experience. Um, so Fine Home Building had a booth this year, and we did some uh, – you know, activities in the booth that were super fun, um, made a bunch of hats, uh, you know, did a little happy hour, gave away pint glasses. Um, and so it was, it was really fun to be there. And then it was so great to like put more names to faces, you know, like Jeremy Castle was like much taller than I thought he was going to be. <laughs> uh, that's like, like having met people virtually so much, like I'm always amazed at like how tall people are or how tall people aren't. Um, and and then the show itself was was great. You know, there's there's so much discussion about electrification and heat pumps. Um, you know, Ross uh, Ross Trithui gave some pretty good uh, talks. Those were sort of like the standouts uh, in my mind this year. Um, you know, always always happy to see some high performance building details too. And then you know, the, it's it's amazing how how many bad decks there are out there and so like getting to see somebody talk through deck construction in a way that's approachable and straightforward um it's it's like the concepts aren't that hard to learn about and it's like i'm i'm not sure where the disconnect happens between like knowing the proper ways to build a deck and what you see attached to people's houses all over the country even new decks, right, are built badly sometimes. It's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. I love the show. I, I think it's uh, probably the best way for uh, tradespeople and contractors to up their game in, as far as their business and their skills and uh, how to manage uh, customers, all of it. And uh, if you haven't gone, I think you should. And we'll talk more about that in the after show because uh, uh, I really want folks to go and I think it helps the business. Jeff, you uh, told me ahead of the show that you have a um, a shoot next week. Where are you going? Um, it's at Taunton. It's <laughs> it's a thread shoot. And and what are the uh, what are you shooting uh, them making? Uh, it's it's more a technique video than it is a project video. So it's it's about smart couture. Cool. <laughs> I uh, I love the pr products that Taunton makes from all brands. I think the company does a great job for their respective audiences. It's it's good work. It's it's such a cool culture. Like everyone makes stuff, um, and you don't find that everywhere you work, which is which is really great. You pointed out something very interesting to me at the live show, Andrew. That um, the more folks you meet in the Taunton universe, you realize that they have their own aesthetic, oftentimes, and. Uh, it's not something that's celebrated as much as their hand shops, but the design skill is part of it too. Yeah. It, it's like, we're really good at making physical products that people consume and read. And, um, we, you know, we put a great deal of emphasis into, um, the design of, of the products we make, um, and making sure people can understand what we're talking about and can learn, um, in ways that are effective and also empowering and fun. And very fun. <laughs> um, we heard from our friend Doug in Colorado. Hi, Patrick. I watched your answers to my question about guest room heat zones in my slab radiant heat. The answer confirmed what I had been thinking. It's only used a f few times during the winter, but when raising the temperature, the system runs for hours. The other zones only require occasional heat to maintain the temperature. As to temperature, the uh, cost, the affordability is one reason I went with this system when building. I used a system from Radiant Tech in Vermont. This was profiled by Scott Gibson in issue 201, and his article convinced me to go with it. I let my son and friend lay the PEX tubing, and with my son's help, the rest of the installation was very straightforward. There's no ductwork, as AC is not needed here. 
If you, if you have experience with plumbing and soldering copper tubing, you can do the install in a day. Uh, the best temp for guests? Years ago, I asked my chiropractor about an extra firm mattress. He said it was an excellent choice for a guest room. Sort of the same idea. As always, the podcast is informative and fun. Doug. I think that references my suggestion that to make the room colder for guests and they won't. Yeah. Depends on who's staying, right? Um, this comes from my friend Jeremy. Interesting aside, Jeremy is the first uh, contributor I worked with in my very early days at JLC. Sometimes folks ask me how uh, you get to be a contributor for a uh, trade publication, and uh, my answer is often, it's very random. So Jeremy wrote in asking if we were going to test uh, miter saw stands, and I said, would you like to? <laughs> 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 so he did. Uh, he writes, hey, Patrick and crew, these days I spend a lot more time behind a steering wheel than on a job site, so I get to listen to all kinds of podcasts. I have a few items for your question about what new homes don't have that old homes had. Here are a few. Squeaky mahogany front porch boards, <laughs> detailed real wood millwork, a room without a screen or smart device, just quiet. Hope you and family are well, Jeremy. Hi, guys. Have a great afternoon. So uh, good to hear from you, Jeremy. It delights me that you listen to the show. Um, and I like squeaky porch boards, too. So I'm in this uh, middle of this project where I'm replacing the subfloor in some of our rooms upstairs. And we're going. it's like I think the originals, you know, like four inch tongue and groove pine of some sort that's had various floorings applied to it, you know, either with adhesive or without over the last hundred years uh and going from that to just a piece of osb subfloor glued and screwed to the joist it's like how quiet that is in comparison <laughs> is is like a game changer um and i've also been uh insulating uh on, in that floor space too because it's you know the bedrooms are above the kitchen and the dining room and the, the living room um and introducing some quiet into my creaky old house has been very rewarding and like often surprising. Are you crawling around in those horrible knee wall spaces to do this work? Uh, no, uh, we have full height walls, uh, in all of our rooms upstairs. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but there's plenty of cr crawling around still. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't be air ceiling without crawling around. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's uh, smart to take those. It's smart to take those opportunities when you open things up like that and you get pulling all the old flooring off to put in the insulation because it's not something that's often done even on new homes. And when we go in to do something, uh, pull a ceiling down, we say, hey, you know, it's not going to quiet everything between the floors, but just that little bit of insulation helps take the edge off of the noise transmission. Mm -hmm. Keith wrote in with some thoughts on old houses. In episode 549, the team was talking about old home features that we miss, don't miss, or wish homes still featured. As a kid, I remember visiting friends with an old home that had a second staircase in the back off the kitchen. This narrow winder stair was such a novel to me at the time, and while I didn't sneak out as a teenager, I was perpetually hungry. If our home had this second staircase, I would have been able to sneak from my bedroom on the second floor to the kitchen without going past my parents. That would have been cool. <laughs> I remember some of my friends having back staircases too, Keith, and I thought the same thing. I love the tight, curvy uh, quality of that. It's awesome. Is that a thing you see out in uh, Tucson, Mike? I'm betting you don't. <laughs> no, but every house I've been in is all, all uh, you know, one story for the most part. It's funny, the hotel I stayed in while I was at JLC Live had uh, uh, one of those old school elevators with the cage door you have to close by yourself and you get to see yourself traveling between the floors. And then once I got to the top you know, floor that the elevator went to, I had to climb up what amounted to the back staircase, including a section with winders and a section I had to tilt my head to get around it. It was pretty fun. <laughs> I wonder how you get a permit for that, honestly, in a hotel, right? Doesn't that seem <laughs> kind of weird? <laughs> we bump into that all the time with those old back staircases in um, working on older homes, particularly the, uh, the three-family walk-ups without having the back staircase. And when we renovate some of the upper units, in, in our, at least in our code, the three families end up in commercial code. And then that triggers a whole bunch of requirements for fire separation, guardrails, handrails, and with the stairs, riser height, and they just don't even meet the code. So that then depending on the code official, they'll sometimes end up making us put these 
big things, big stairways on the outside of the building that just mm. kills the aesthetic of it. But that's code. Do they ever let you uh, get a pass because it's existing, Mike? In some cases, we can go to, uh, they have building board, building code boards of review in some cities and towns or the state would, and then we can go to them and petition for maintaining the old stairway as it was with uh, some upgrades within reason that we can accomplish within the space, but it's always a, it, it's time consuming, I guess, is the, the big thing um, on the on the permitting side to, to get that. Well, and it, to me, it's a balancing act because, you know, all of a sudden, if you have to put uh, big staircases on and change uh, units significantly, they get more expensive, right? But, you know, poor people shouldn't be forced to live in a unsafe apartment that they can't get out of in an emergency, too. So I don't know how it, it's yeah. it's a complex issue. It is. I asked Carol the same question about she grew up in an old house, what she missed about old houses. And she mentioned steam radiators. She said, if you get the right distance from a steam radiator, you can just bake very comfortably <laughs> and be com warm in an otherwise cold house. Uh, she also mentioned frost on windows, which struck me as very odd. I was like, what do you miss about frost on windows? And she's like, it's beautiful and that the patterns are different room to room. And I was like, okay, I get that. <laughs> And then she also said sleeping porches. And uh, did, have you guys ever lived in a place with a sleeping porch, Jeff? Anyone? No. Yeah, I have. Um, no. Well, my grandparents' house, and it was pretty cool. It was, you know, they didn't have air conditioning. Just a, again, it was a three-story tenant, uh, you know, walk-up thing, and uh, they were on one of the floors, and there were these stacked porches, three floors up, and we used that as a sleeping porch in the summertime when it was otherwise hot and miserable in the house. Uh, my understanding is that idea was an outcrop of the Spanish flu uh, epidemic that folks wanted fresh air, uh, especially during the, um, when you were otherwise inside uh, in you know flu season. So that you're saying we can draw a direct line from the sleeping porch to the ERV? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's exactly what I was saying. Dak wrote in, he says, a couple of thoughts. I think Ian pretty much mic dropped with his explanation of the difference between patios and decks. Patios connect to the outside, decks, decks connect to the structure, choose accordingly. Uh, one thing that was missed, in my opinion, was longevity. Trex has maximum warranty is for 50 years, and I'd love to see how one looks after just 20. Mother Nature's warranty for Carol's Bluestone patio is longer. <laughs> Carol's Bluestone Patio is is beautiful, Patrick. But that was like one of the coolest things I saw at your house. Um, I, I agree. Uh, Carol is quite a worker and uh, has quite a aesthetic uh, sensibility. So, you know, put that together and you got a pretty amazing Bluestone Patio. <laughs> um, this is about Roger, who wrote in about conditioning his shop in Little River, uh, North Carolina, which is in very southern North Carolina. Uh, greetings, Patrick. Thank, thanks so much for taking the time to email me back. I've attached a few pics uh, from my past and a few things I'm working on. Um, I added some pics of the ships I was on. I had a pretty varied career in the, in the Coast Guard, including pollution investigation, search and rescue, drug and fisheries informant, and aids to navigation, maintenance, and construction. I was a navigator and command chief on the USCG Dallas, a ship that's main mission was to conduct counter drug operations in the Southern Caribbean, which provided nonstop action due to our, due to our ability to chase over the horizon with our small boat, assisted by a helicopter crew that could shoot out the outboards of bad guys. I also served as an executive petty officer on the Cheyenne and Sumac, and was lucky enough to command the Anvil, constructing aids to the navigation in the low country of Florida and North Carolina. There have been several other ships, including temporary duty on Navy ships, conducting training and counter drug operations, and several multi-mission stations where we operated small boats 45 feet and below, conducting search and rescue and law enforcement. Again, I owe the FHB podcast and the Pro Talk podcast for giving me the confidence to start this third career in construction, so please pass on my many thanks to everyone. I'm certain I'll be going back to the well when the work of my ranch house starts in earnest, which better be soon. 
Uh, please don't feel like you have to read this email on the podcast. Hearing it will likely send me back to grammar camp. <laughs> <laughs> Roger, I, I think it's a great email, and your writing is fine. And I loved seeing the uh, boats you were on. I had no idea the Coast Guard did so many things. Did you guys un- realize this? I mean, I don't even live by a coast. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, cool stuff. Uh, I do love uh, that a small boat uh, is 45 feet and below. Um, that still sounds like <laughs> a pretty big boat to me. <laughs> I love the cool people that listen to the podcast. And, uh, oh, my gosh, they're very interesting. Roger, thanks for writing in. It's really cool to see your uh, career in the Coast Guard. Uh, first question comes from Steve. With Mike Gurton being the authority on decks, I thought I'd take advantage of his expertise and ask if he can think of a better and or more cost-effective way of draining this third-floor covered exterior deck. See attached photo. It's new to be built. In the photo, you'll see this space is over an interior space and involves a raised flooring system with a scupper drain, which connects to a gutter. Is there a better way of drainage? If it helps, this again is a covered space, just 91 square feet, and the new build is to be an area with 20 inches of rain and nine inches of snow annually. I'm just a lowly homeowner, but your podcast has been a healthy combination of entertainment and information during the process of getting the house designed with my architect. And from my other pictures I provided, you can see the ceiling integrated headers I previously emailed about, and you are kind enough to discuss it it on the podcast with Mike. They were integrated into the design. Please don't read all of this (laughs) long-winded email. So, folks, if you don't want me to read the long-winded email, I don't know. I think they're fine. So what do you guys think? (laughs) It wasn't that long-winded of of um, an email. I mean, I think it's fine. Good good length. What about... uh, living space under decks. This is always uh, a challenge. Am I right? Well, for, first off, um, I just wanted, I, I'm not an authority on decks necessarily. I've just done a lot of writing and videos. Um, there are, um, and I, this is a case well, where he's calling it a deck over living space. I wouldn't even call it a deck. I'd call it more of a porch because it has a roof over it and it could be enclosed. So it's more of a porch. And I, I always think of decks as, as, as Ian said, just attached to the house. It's not integral to and not integral. Um, so um, this is more of a porch. And with the living space below it, it, it kind of gets outside of my expertise, really. So um, I've done a couple of sleeper decks over sloped roofs before like this uh it looks like the architect really spent a lot of time overthinking things um in the design that's impossible <laughs> <laughs> well I, I noticed a little red dotted line i think it was noted as the wrb and it, it goes under the membrane roof and i'm thinking well usually under membrane roofs we don't put a wrb there's no secondary weather barrier under a membrane roof, but maybe he has other things he's thinking about with, with what that would function as. But it looks like he has a built-in gutter where, uh, so it looks like he's put, putting sleepers over the, first they're ripping the joists to have a slope to them. <laughs> and then they're putting sleepers on top of it. And then towards the outside edge, there's a drop in the way the sleepers would be installed or notch in them. So it would create an actual gutter space. Um, often we'll, we'll just put a slope on the, the rafters or the, the ceiling joist, I should say, uh, that the deck would be over. And then we let the water kind of just like either flow off the end or in this case where it's got a, a little, looks like a beam at the end. We'll let it go into there and flow down rather than making this extra drop in there. Uh, just simplify it. Nice, clean, straight lines with the slope and then let the water go down. Uh, then they have uh, pedestals, which are just these little uh, screw-threaded plastic devices that will adjust so you can get a flat surface with the sleeper deck. Um, that all looks it looks fine. I don't see any places where you could add economy to it other than eliminating the that little inch and a half drop in that, the sleepers to create that gutter. Just let the water flow to the uh, vertical at the outside edge where it goes up to the beam and then just let the water flow off whichever direction left or right. In uh, 
Pittsburgh, they would call this kind of arrangement a box gutter. So it's like let into the rafters at the end of the roof and uh there's no like hanging gutter off the fascia like a modern K style gutter or half round gutter. This makes it way harder to put this internal gutter here because uh, all of a sudden that doesn't drain water for every reason. Now the water's backing up into the space. If you just give it a chance to run off the edge of the deck, that yep. seems way more reliable because exactly. it can run off at any point along its entire length versus this gutter that's channeling it into one spot. So that would be my suggestion. I think everything else looks okay. Well, the other thing to consider, too, for the economy of it is why put a sleeper deck over that roof? Instead of that, you can they have vinyl decking materials, which are roofs, um, Duradeck and weather deck and a couple of others. So they could just create a flat plane with the sheathing, uh, roof sheathing over the top, and then just uh, adhere the – it's like vinyl flooring for mm – -hmm. A deck and then you've got one membrane sure it'll be sloped at you know an eighth or a quarter of an inch per foot but um, it's done all the time on you know condo projects and apartments and I'm sure they're doing it there for economy it's an aesthetic of it have you used that product Mike I've, I've seen it only at trade shows um, I've been trained on it um, I haven't had the opportunity I, I've, I've you know suggested it to some homeowners um, on decks over living space and um, we didn't end up going that way. We went with another alternative. But. I'll be honest. Uh, I, I think the look is not for everybody. Maybe it looks uh, different now, but it, it kind of looks like vinyl flooring. It does. <laughs> <laughs> I do uh, also I, love the, uh, the boat tie in here. It's, it's, we've got the level three crow's nest interior. I like, I want to see the rest of this house. <laughs> Totally. Um, our next question comes from Esther. Hey there, I'm a seven, 72 years old, and I have a question about an older home built in 1973. It has a six-inch fiberglass rolled insulation bats in the attic eaves. If I wanted to have new blown-in foam insulation installed in the attic, do I have to remove the old insulation first? Will there be a vapor barrier problem? I thank you for your response. Sincerely, Esther. I, Andrew, I think you should take this one on, buddy. Uh, so, you know, what you'll find in that attic, you know, who, who really knows, but I think if you're going to the effort to re-insulate it, removing that insulation, uh, sealing your, your ceiling barrier there, and then spraying in new, you know, it's like your, your chance to do this right, you know, with everything we know about building science today. Um, and that, that's how I would approach it. You don't have to remove the old insulate. Well... Okay, they're doing blown in foam insulation. And so it would, yes, you do need to remove the insulation in order to get your seal on the floor. Um, but you would want to do that anyway, because this is your opportunity to do things right um, and protect the home for as long as you can. Do y'all think a uh, blower door test might be in order before any of this work happens? I kind of think so. I, I would also question why you want to do blown in foam insulation if, you know, uh, fiberglass has functioned okay. <laughs> yeah, I would do an air tightness test, see where the big holes are, and then address accordingly before any insulation strategy in almost all cases, unless you really know what you're dealing with. And she asked the question, will there be a vapor barrier problem? Uh, and I wonder where the concern is there and what, how that would be addressed. What do you think? I don't think there would be a vapor barrier problem if she put foam or if just pulling the insulation back and doing good air sealing because that's really just air control. It's not really a, a vapor barrier problem. And in fact, the vapor um, barrier, if, you, if, if the blown in or sprayed on foam was the uh, closed cell, uh, it's done all the time in contact with ceilings and it doesn't seem to cause any sort of problem. So I yeah. wouldn't worry about it. Either way, either way, I wouldn't worry about it. I, I think a BPI or uh, what's the other one? ResNet a certified Raider is going to be able to uh, check out your house, Esther, and explain the various trade-offs and concerns with uh, how you fix it or insulate it, air seal it. And uh, I think that would be money well spent. It's usually just a few hundred or a thousand bucks. And uh, it's good to have a plan before you do this stuff because the work is expensive and... 
gosh, why do it twice? And check with, uh, if you're going to go that route and bring in uh, somebody BPI certified or ResNet, um, check to see if your utility company has any programs for energy efficiency upgrades or the local um, weatherization assistance program that's funded through the federal government or through other agencies. You might be able to get some free advice there. And what we can tell you based on your short description is going to be more general in nature, whereas somebody, you know, like Patrick's pointing out, eyes on the problem and they'll be able to advise you very specifically to what's existing there. Increasingly, states have money, I believe, to to help mm -hmm. people uh, weatherize and improve their energy, their home's energy performance. Mm -hmm. This comes from Frank. Uh, this may be a topic that could have many variables, but you may be able to help me understand how severe an issue this could be. I've been talking to people about basement issues in homes over 10 years old. The floor is settled in some areas, like a corner, up to four inches and along two walls that create the corner that settles two inches and two to one inches along the other wall. The issue is based on, the, on what is the actual cause that could cause the soil to not be compacted and have the slab subside. I suspect maybe there's water running under it since the house is on a hill. How do you inspect this and then produce the correct solution? I've been told that the price could range from a $100 fix to $20,000 or more. <laughs> this is, of course, something I have encountered. Thanks for your consideration, Frank. Okay, so Frank's got a friend, it sounds like. Do you think this is really Frank or is this Frank's friend? It's hard to know. <laughs> <laughs> Frank's friend has a slab, a basement slab that's settled what sounds like two inches on one wall and an inch on another. And uh, what the heck's going on there? What do we think? Um, I, I have no clue. I mean, there are also there are so many things that could be going on. And my first concern is, if your slab in a basement is sinking, then what about the foundation? I mean, is it being undermined by running water? And now are you going to have foundation problems? And or was it installed on backfill? In which cases, again, the, if the slab's going down, the, the foundation. So I'm curious how this was installed. I've seen this happen on garages where we'll pour a frost wall of maybe four feet tall or maybe a little more. Then we backfill the inside where the overdig was, and then the slab will sink. But in a basement, it's usually you don't excavate below. Well, anyway, yeah, I'm confused. What, what would be causing it? So... How, what, what would we do to figure this out? Like in my mind immediately, I was like, we'll just go to that corner and bust out a square of concrete and see what's going on. Yep, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, There's only one way to know, and that's to dig okay. into it. And that's yep. the answer for so many problems, right? What's going on here? Well, you got to tear stuff apart to find out. I think that uh, it might have been organic material, but you know, like uh, on the soil before they they poured the slab. I think it could be uh, groundwater movement uh, underneath. I think it could be uh, poor compaction of backfill. Uh, I think it could be like just completely bogus concrete uh, that was done badly. I don't know. There's lots of possible options. Well, and I'm also curious, like, what's going on on the first floor above this area? Like, if if the foundation is moving, you'll you'll see evidence of that likely on the first floor. But if it's not, then it's like even more of a head scratcher <laughs> a little bit. Um, you know, I don't know how often people really do it uh, in the real world. But if if your footing is has steel reinforcement in it, um It'll span uh, a soft section of ground, right? Mm -hmm. um, but if you have a concrete slab without reinforcement, which is common, uh, it's not gonna. If if the soil is is uh, uh, missing or uh, settling underneath it, it's gonna break. But this you is at even... a corner too. It, when yeah. you when we do. Your corners end up being a little bit more finicky than uh, as far as uh, if we reinforce the footing than along the wall. The wall is going to act kind of as a straight beam if it's boarded at either end, whereas a corner, you're, I'm thinking it's caving in. You know, it could be they overdug, uh, they poured a footing, and then they backfilled inside the footing. So in that case, there would be a limit to how far that would. Settle. I just had a thought. What? If you have a leaky water service, uh, it'll often manifest Ooh. as this uh, problem, right? It's washing that um, 
soil away as the pipe is leaking. And it could happen with both a waistline or a supply line. And if it's happening with a supply line, um, you can the, actually hear it with a stethoscope oftentimes, right? Well, I think busting out the slab in that area seems like the only way you're going to really see what's going on and figure it out. I was going to say you could, uh, you know, with a stethoscope, knock on it and see if it sounds hollow and then bust it out. But, you know, <laughs> you might as well just bust it out. If bust you're, it out. Yeah. <laughs> and what can be done, too, I've, I've cut out slabs before uh, when we're doing uh, basement drains and we'll usually go in like a foot or two you know, up in the slab and then we just do a saw cut and even with a, a you know a, maybe a seven and a quarter eight inch diamond blade you're only going to get a couple inches in but at least it gives you a, a clean break so that you don't ha end up hammering and hammering and hammering <laughs> to try to chip it away it kind of gets you a, a, a nice break line and then the, if there is uh, hollow underneath it'll crack off a little easier Start in a corner so you can have uh, the pieces of concrete break away. If you try and start in the center, uh, it's a lot harder. Uh, and once you get one piece out, like cutting a cake or a quiche, uh, the rest of it is much easier, right? A cake or a quiche. <laughs> concrete slab. I never thought I'd hear them in the same, uh, same sentence. It's a good alliteration even. Um, this comes from TJ and, and Mike, this question came to you. Do you remember this? You sent this to me a little while back. Uh, TJ wrote, writes in, I'm renovating an old three-story balloon frame house. There are mortared bricks in each stud bay from the foundation up about six inches above the floor level installed as fire blocks. And on the second and third floor, there are bricks that from uh, forming the lead in ledger that uh, up about the same inches. Uh, six inches above the floor. I'm trying to insulate and air seal the house as best I can. Can I safely remove the bricks and mortar and fire block another way? Ideally, I'd like to insulate the walls and not have the bricks preventing me from doing so. I've gutted the inside of the building so it's fairly easy to chip out bricks and mortar. Thanks, TJ. Mike, have you run into this situation in your career? I have. And you know, the funny thing is, I don't know if it's my short-term memory problem or because I get so many questions each week from people. I don't remember this question <laughs> sending it to you <laughs> i thought you were going to say we already answered it which would have been worse <laughs> <laughs> then we both be <laughs> oh that's funny but um yeah i've run into it uh, often and i've gotten this question uh, uh, a, a few times asked in different ways and the short end well the the purpose of those those bricks or mortar that they pour in those uh balloon framed um, the, the bottom of walls is to, is fire blocking, and that was before we did insulation in walls. But now you can, the code allows us, we only need uh, 16 inches of insulation, fiberglass bats, stuffed in the cavity above and below, because it's, not that I would just say only insulate a little bit, but the idea there is that the, uh, the f fire spread isn't going to go through that, um, the insulation, it, it's going to act as a fire block itself, or you could put in solid wood blocking. So there are alternatives to that mortar and bricks, pull it out and then either fill the cavities with uh, fiberglass or uh, stone or rock wool, or you could at each uh, ledger level where the floor is put solid two by blocking between the adjacent studs and that would suffice as a um, a fire block. You just want those cavities to be broken up into sections so that fire can't go from a wall into a floor that's the, the or into a roof that's the risk of of uh, balloon frame buildings. In our habitat builds in Pittsburgh they were generally uh, rehabilitated Tated homes that were uh, often, you know, tax delinquent or re repossessed by the bank, and uh, you know, one of the things we would do is rip out all the plaster and then and run new mechanicals and insulate and air seal. But we would have to do this because many of them were balloon framed. And I tell you, if you're going to use wood blocking, you have to buy two by sixes because the old studs are often bigger than three and a half inches, so a two by four will not work for that work. So you have to rip uh, wider stock down to fit the whatever peculiar dimension those studs in your place happen to be. Is, so are, is it more important to stop airflow between cavities or is it more important to have like a solid material in between cavities that stops airflow? 
Well, back in the day, those cavities were all open, so you needed something in the middle to keep it from being a big chimney in the event of a fire. Uh, and, and the concern is still the same, but mm -hmm. it's less likely now with uh, good insulation materials. I'm guessing you wouldn't have to do this if you dense packed. What do you think, Mike? Yeah. Well, I, I think in the code it, it says 16 inches of fiberglass above and below wherever your um, concealed uh, connection is. The concealed uh, mm -hmm. connection is between a stud bay and a floor space or a stud bay and a, and a, and a roof rafter. Um, if the if the the floor above and below those uh, floor joists is covered, um, so the uh, I th I mean it's the code doesn't list cellulose, but I know cellulose will do the trick because with the borates that they put in there, it's actually probably a lot denser and more fire resistant than even fiberglass. But yeah, it's packed in there really tight and it doesn't yeah. allow airflow, which makes it a great insulating material too. As uh, well, yeah. yeah. The trick with blown in with a balloon framed house is you have to, and the insulators know this, they know how to do it from the outside. You have to put in like these socks, these net socks into each joist bay. Otherwise you start blowing and it's going and going and going. And what you're doing is you're filling the floor joist cavity. So without these uh, socks, which block the cellulose from going in. So they, they'll stuff a sock into the hole, they'll blow it and it contains the cellulose at the uh, floor joist level. And then when they blow above or below in the wall cavities, it doesn't fill those joist bays. Mm. It's kind of fun to do it uh, if, <laughs> if, if you've never done it. It's, it's, it takes some technique, developing a technique. You think that's fun? It is like the like <laughs> slowest process I have ever seen <sighs> in my entire life. It drove me nuts to, uh, yeah. You know, if you don't do it every day, it's fun to do something different. You know, it's that, you know, you never get bored with being a remodeler generalist uh, because there's every day there's something. Whether you're on a roof today for a couple of days, then you're doing some siding, then you're doing some trim carpentry or kitchen remodel inside, and then blowing insulation for a few days. So, yeah. I can see that, I guess. So can you readily get the equipment to do this work, Mike, uh, at a rental yard? How do you get a... a powerful enough cellulose blower to dense pack? Uh, I would, if I was doing it, I would, in a, and I was a homeowner, you know, if you're gutting out the inside, I would just use uh, a stone or rock wool bats or, or fiberglass mm. bats um, just for the convenience. Um, if you're going to be opening it up anyway, and it sounds like TJ would be because he's talking about, he's taking these bricks he knows, out. Yeah. <laughs> he knows that those mortar and the bricks are there. So, it must be opening it up on a, either a floor by floor basis or on, you know, room by room basis. I got to wonder why bricks like carpenters <laughs> don't put bricks in wood things, right? Like why was this the material of choice? My guess is because, you know, some bricks are garbage for building with. Um, and if, you know, the house was built in the right time in history, when a lot of masonry construction was going on, there might've been, you know, this resource of, uh, free bricks or low cost bricks that you could use them for this purpose, but it strikes me as odd. I see it around the homes I work on that were built between like the early 20s and the 1950s, like the mid 50s before platform framing came into vogue. And and I believe just, and I'm making you know some assumptions here that it had to do with some building codes that were introduced in some nearby cities um, in Rhode Island anyway, that they realized that the balloon frame homes that were built in the 1800s were just going up in flames really quickly. And they realized that if we put these bricks in there, we stop the flames from going through floors, you know, up the walls into floors, and we reduce the uh, spread of fire. So it's, you know, it would just be localized. Um, and that same time in that 1920s was when we saw a lot of electrification, electrification of existing old homes. And that of course, if the wiring wasn't done right, that's when that sparked the fires that burned all these old houses down. It's a bit of a non sequitur, but your mention of uh, electrification of homes uh, reminded me, I saw in my Facebook feed a couple days ago, somebody had pulled the ceiling down in a, I'm guessing a house that was probably built in the 20s or 30s. And uh, 
It had gas piping and electrical <laughs> wires run to the ceiling box. <laughs> yes. Which I was like, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. I'm guessing it was like, you could call it dual fuel, right? Uh, <laughs> they, they didn't know what was going to catch on, or maybe they wanted both for redundancy. Why do you think they were both there? You know, it would be nice to talk to somebody who was working then to get the whole um, – sequence of when different things came into mm -hmm. a community because i know in some places the natural gas was run uh in the in at some point in the 1800s because it was abandoned as their lighting uh choice when uh elect when the wiring came in because it was more convenient and you didn't have this <laughs> all of these gas lights on the wall sconces and uh, ceiling fixtures you know it, and if you want to take this uh, a little further, if you look at the design of a lot of the lighting fixtures, they're based on a natural gas, gas flame yeah. that we used, and those you know the shades, the metal shades, and the mm -hmm. cone shape that was done to for specific functions. You know, it was there to keep the, you away from bumping into that flame and providing the light where you wanted it. And now we've just assumed that all lighting fixtures have to be of that era. Um, kind of got into our design vernacular. What struck me was how shallow the gas piping was buried in the ceiling. Like, uh, it was just <laughs> below the plaster line. And I'm like, that is so dangerous. I mean, no one's hanging pictures on their ceiling, obviously, but uh, it was not protected like we do today. Well, and it seemed the like the pipe was thinner, too. It doesn't, didn't look like uh, steel black pipe to me. Well, that's what I was curious because I used to see the old three eighths and half inch, and they were steel wall. I mean, they were they were pretty substantial in their diameter or, or the wall thickness. So, it yeah, could have been. I'm guessing it, I've seen just what you said, and and you can see where somebody trenched out the old horsehair plaster, put the gas line in, and then just plastered over it, and then they'd wallpaper over that, so you could see there was a little. Uh, you know, it, it, they didn't do a perfect job. And and similarly, in, in the floors, you could tell in this house, uh, on the uh, top of the what was the first floor ceiling joist, uh, the f second floor floor joist, they just trenched out uh, the boards for that were the subfloor to run the, I'm guessing, the wiring subsequently after the, the gas lines. And uh, we still rough in wa uh, wires in old work the same way, <laughs> right? <laughs> scary uh i feel like these questions would be great for our building code historian glenn matthewson um you know it feels oh, like yeah uh there there there's something something there i mean especially thinking about like why why are these bricks showing up in houses in from the 20s to the 50s um and and it one of the things i really enjoyed from jlc was that glenn was one of our winners of builders jeopardy um and was like so it it the, the, that guy is just such a font of knowledge and, and brings code to life in a way that, like, I never thought possible. Um, but I'd be curious to, to hear what, what he thinks about, ga like, gas lines and, and electrical and walls together and, and why that came to be. That was the best segue ever, Andrew. Uh, that reminds me to tell you folks that we're going to be talking about the JLC live show and Builders Jeopardy, uh, hosted by Fine Home Building. And I want to talk about the contestants at, uh, uh, at our Building Jeopardy in the after show. We had um, Glenn Matthewson, Brian Campbell, uh, Connor. What was Connor's last name? Uh, Connor Malloy. Malloy uh, and R&R um, &R Buildings. Uh, uh, Kyle Stumpin' Horse. Kyle Stumpin' Horse. Uh, that was super fun. So we had to talk about that. It's like the nerdiest uh, building folks I know. Uh, all it was in the just same. so fun to like yeah. write the questions, Patrick. It was, oh, yeah. And you did a fantastic job. The questions were very good. I mean, I still don't think I can st spell Steebrick, but, uh, <laughs> you know, that's, that's, I don't have to because I was the host. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, we'll talk more about that. I felt like if if Jeopardy were had the same real Jeopardy had the same categories, I might have a chance on the show. So that was pretty <laughs> fun. 
Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Thanks to Mike, Andrew, and Jeff for joining me, and thanks to all of you for listening. Please remember to send us your comments, questions, and suggestions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. And please like, comment, or review us however you're listening. It helps other folks find our podcast. Stay safe, everybody. Keep craft alive. Happy building. Happy building.